John Schuler, welcome back to Acquiring Minds. Thanks so much, Will. So glad to be here. John, your original episode aired in January 2022, so just over a year ago. You had closed on your business the previous October, so October 2021, and we were talking then, just, you'd only been in the seat a couple of months. It has been 14-ish months now, and you're older and wiser, and in a position to reflect back on some of those ideas and impressions that you had shared with us the first time around. So we're eager to hear some of these reflections. But first things first, John, please just give us a quick refresher on the business that you bought. Sure. So I bought a an appliance repair company um, in, I would call a mid-sized city in South Carolina, where we had seven technicians, um, three office staff and a part-timer, um, plus the owner who uh, um, left left the business when, when he sold. Um, and so we just focus on residential appliance repair. Excellent. And give us a sense of like size of revenue ballpark, if you could. Yeah, they were doing about 1.2 million. It had increased by 15%. Um, every year for three years prior. So it appeared to be growing at a pretty steady clip um, and was somewhere between 200 and 250 SDE, depending on how you count it. And you had moved from Virginia. You'd moved your whole family to kind of settle down where you, where you ultimately bought. There was a lot of I mean, uprooting your family to do this. And also, but kind of you wanted to lay roots down in, in the city where you ultimately settled, right? That was kind of the personal backstory. Yeah, so my wife and I are actually both from here and had moved away five years prior. So this was for us, it was coming back home, back to our parents and our kids' grandparents, um, a lot of friends we had. So it was great to relay a lot of those roots, um, but it was, you know, disruptive as any move with, yeah. with kids can be. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great, John. Well, just give us the headline 14 months into this. How do you feel? <laughs> I feel great simple, today. Simple question, right? Yeah, it's easy. It's easy. I, I feel great today, right now, at this moment. Um, <laughs> I've I've learned to to ride the roller coaster. Um, I mean, hourly ups and downs some days, but um, I, I've been. I think the the best way to describe it, the the feeling is that I have paid a great deal of tuition to this point, um, and have learned enough that I I actually feel really good right now like we've we can see the light at the end of the tunnel um and and so i'm really excited about the future of this company and we're and feel like we're kind of on that threshold of being um where where i'd really like to be excellent well that's that's certainly positive you refer to a roller coaster ride so it's there's been some down been some down moments some some white knuckled moments um has it been dark at times <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. So when, when we talked for our, for the interview, uh, last year, I think that was about halfway through, you know, what I kind of now think of as a honeymoon period, um, where, uh, I came in on day one, I explained that I wanted to keep everything the way it was that I, you know, bought what I thought was just a really great company and I wanted it to continue being that way. Um, nobody quit on day one. We kind of made it through that first week of jitters and then I think there was just a couple months where we were all kind of holding our breath and waiting and seeing, um, and, uh, through, you know, various things that were, um, primarily mostly out of my hands. Uh, we, we ended up losing, uh, almost all of our volume from a really big customer that paid us really well. And that it was essentially wiped away 20% of our revenue overnight. So, that created a ton of problems having to take on more work that was less profitable. Technicians commissions weren't as, as high as they had gotten used to, um, you know, were harder to cover overhead and all that. And so that kind of was the, a big, the end of the honeymoon period, which began the period of, um, kind of, uh, falling off in a lot of ways is that the effects of that big loss rippled through, um, the, the process and the personnel. And then, uh, we've been slowly building back up, um, since that. And so, you know, that's why I say right now, I feel really good. Um, but it's, it's been a, a real process. A lot of the, 
you know, stuff you see on Twitter in particular from, um, I think, uh, Reg Zeller has the best one about being in the fetal position in your bathroom at 2 a.m. Um, I haven't gone fetal, but I've, I've shed tears. It's been, Mm -hmm. um, pretty dark at times and you don't see the, Mm -hmm. the end in those days, but, um, yeah, where, where we are, you know, a year removed from that now we're, we're feeling a lot better. Wow, John, that's, that's powerful. Um, and, and to just add a little bit of color to this particular detail of your journey in the appliance repair business, you can get customers just calling you direct from the internet or whatever, or you can also get customers from the appliance companies themselves, the manufacturer who feeds you leads or feeds you more than leads, cust- true customers, I guess. And it was one of those relationships that went, went away, correct? Yeah. So there's, there's manufacturers, there's also home warranty companies. Um, mm. and we contract with a good many of those. When I bought the business, I was really excited about the high percentage of the revenue that came from these companies because they just send you work orders and you don't have to advertise. And that's great. Um, what I did not realize was that you have administrative expenses associated with communication back and forth, um, accounts receivable, and they don't pay you right away. And then uh, they, the, the more business you do with them, the more, the bigger of a dot you get on their radar and the more likely they are to go find another low cost provider in your area and cut your volume. Um, so there's a lot of risk there. There's a lot of benefits as well. So I don't, I'm not targeting going to a hundred percent, you know, cash on delivery COD jobs. Um, but I have, I have, uh, swayed much more so towards a healthier mix, which may be anywhere from 50, 50 to more, much more COD than, than warranty. Um, so we're, we're definitely at a healthier place now and targeting that healthier mix, but, um, those, those warranty and manufacturer contracts can, can be, uh, you know, a double edged sword. Yeah. Yeah. And so is this one of those where a year later, as painful as it was, your, you know, your foundation is stronger now because you have kind of your sources of revenue are, are sturdier and more profitable than they were a year ago. Yeah. Well, I think I mentioned at some point, um, this past year that, you know, if I had some things to do over again, one is that I would focus on de-risking right from the beginning. Um, I was I was really excited about having processes in place about um, working myself out of the day to day as quickly as possible and building for a you know long term future. And what I think I should have been focused on was recognizing that with only a handful of technicians, any one of them leaving is a huge hit to your bottom line or your your top line. And that is, you know, the same on the jobs coming in side of things, any, any major customer that stops giving you the volume they always have, um, is a big risk. And so, um, de-risking those things by, um, learning how to hire and train better, doing better job of marketing, getting all that stuff in place earlier. That's the, you know, I would say the core of your business is something I, I definitely would have done better um, and sooner. Do you feel like the, found, the, the revenue is kind of more robust, the foundation of the business more robust? Yeah. You didn't choose You didn't choose for it to do, go this way, but maybe ultimately it's for the healthier. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess I kind of got on that train to say, so eventually we figured a lot of that out. So right yeah. now I'm far more confident that I can find and hire and train technicians um, in a shorter amount of time. Um, our revenue mix is a lot healthier and I'm still working on that. It's, it's so tough to, to just learn all that from scratch, but, um, but it's better than it was. And so we've really done a lot for those two primary categories, but then so many other pieces of our business that I probably shouldn't have focused on right away, but at some point you do need to do so a lot of operational improvements and just the small things like which, you know, which tech products are you using? Um, and what are your, what, what SOPs are you going to take time to write down and refine? We've improved so much of that, that it's just, it's a far simpler, easier business to run now than it was when I first came on. Mm-hmm. Well, I just, you, you've just now kind of 
touched on it, but I, I, I want to bring it up explicitly. You tweeted, you know, what would you have done differently? Somebody asked you, what would you have done differently right during the transition? And you just put it so well. You said, you, I would have focused less on how do I get upside and more on how do I pre prevent downside? And in, in all of my interviews, I don't think anyone has ever kind of said that as concisely. It, it's, you know, people are so focused on change and improvement and growth, which is great. We all are. But, you know, part of what makes this such a compelling path is, you know, you're buying a golden goose and, you know, your job is to protect the golden goose. For your first job should be to do that. And maybe people don't, don't, their, in, uh, their instinct is not to do that. So, um, so uh, maybe can, can you elaborate, even though you've really kind of, you've already said it, but maybe just emphasize that point. Sure. So, and it can be a very nuanced discussion. I mean, you know, upside, downside, those can be terms that are super nebulous and, and mean mm. different things to every person. In our case, when I look at our mix of revenue, recognizing that I didn't run an analysis to see which of our customers uh, were more profitable than others until we lost our major customer. So once I did that, I realized very many of these contracts we had in place were at rates that lost money on every job. And that's too late to find out, you know, that's a, that's a downside risk is that if you have a large customer and they leave you, you need to do that analysis for what happens. And it's not just a simple spreadsheet. Okay. We're going to reduce this by 30% across the board. Um, your red doesn't go down. You know, I think that's fairly simple, but what the mix that you're left with needs to be analyzed and seeing if you can do that, um, uh, or, or remain profitable. And then the, the solution to that should have been recognizing these unprofitable customers and how to either make them profitable or how to get off of doing jobs for them so mm -hmm. that we're not, um, we're, we're freed up to do higher revenue things or higher profitability things. Um, on the other side with the technicians, uh, I would have spent more time building deeper relationships with them. I was, I think, uh, I, I certainly tried to do that. I did spend time with them. I wasn't, you know, oblivious or ignoring or anything like that, but recognizing that oftentimes their perception of their value is more important than what their actual value is. So, um, I, I felt like we were providing a huge value as a company, but I didn't always do a good job of helping them understand and see, uh, what they had at our company. And so it made it easy for them to hear, uh, you know, different number, not even necessarily higher, just a different number at a different company and look at switching. Um, when I felt like they really genuinely would have been better off staying with us. So I would have, spend a lot more time doing that. And instead of thinking about how can we um, uh, grow more so that I can hire more technicians and hopefully I can just spend just enough time on these existing technicians to make sure they don't leave. And, and in the end, if I had been focused on that downside of what happens if they leave, I think it would have led to me spending a lot more time and effort um, ensuring that you know they, they felt successful and happy at our company. And and so when you when you talk about wishing that you would have spent more time and attention on the existing technicians or all your employees, is that specifically kind of just positive reinforcement or be, because because one of the things that you often hear is like acquisition entrepreneurs when they buy the business, they should really trust that the existing team knows what they're doing and and get out of their way. What is the the good attention that you should have been giving them more of? versus the getting in their way attention that you were probably right not to do? That's a great question. I think, I think the good intention for me is more positive and affirmative words. Um, I tend to, to forget about that too easily. Yeah. And then the, the practical side as well of when, you know, they had a complaint about the um, brakes in their van or not having a tool they needed it was easy for that to get pushed to the bottom of my to-do list. Mm. And I think that just showed them that that's where they were. They were at the bottom yep. of the list. And yep. I certainly didn't mean that. I certainly didn't want that. I didn't think that way. 
Um, but looking back, it's, it's a lot easier to see now. Yeah. You've got to show very visibly, um, that, that they're at the top of the list. Yeah. That's great. What a, what a powerful lesson to have learned. And John, I, w- I just want to ask because so often in this world, people are buying businesses that they don't frankly know much about the trade or anything about the trade itself. Um, I don't think that you knew much about appliances or how to repair them when you bought your business, uh, but you have learned, you had to learn quick how to hire and train techs. How to just give that? I know this is a, that's probably a very long um, answer to this question, but try to give it a condensed version of like how do you learn how to do that when you when you yourself don't even know the trade? Is it just building processes within the organization where the senior guys and gals are some part of their day is available to train the new guys and gals? What how, what is that? What is that playbook? Yeah, I'll, I'll caveat by saying I haven't figured it out yet. Um, but I have made some big strides from where I started. And I don't think that not knowing a trade should stop somebody from acquiring a company. I just think that's a risk to understand. And if every single one of your technicians leaves on day one, there's not a whole lot of ways around the fact that that's a a pretty bad outcome. Um, What we have done is I have been, uh, I check the technicians in every morning. So I've got, um, my eyeballs on every single job that we do. And with the small size of the company, that's possible. It's not possible in a bigger company. Um, so I have learned to pick up on patterns of where there's a lack of knowledge for a particular appliance types or something like that, or how to deal with this particular customer situation and can provide a little bit of coaching on the customer service side. I can provide some resources for them to go to on the technical side, but for the most part, it's about um, focusing on or, or finding that the training and helping the technicians to find it themselves. So in so many cases, it's just, it's, it's not that anybody that does plumbing or electrical or HVAC or appliance repair, it's not that they can't be really good at it. It's that they don't know where to go to look or they're in too much of a rush to do it. Um, or nobody's ever suggested they take a couple days off the road and go to a training course. So just pushing them towards those things and making the time in our schedule and making sure that their commission isn't going to take a big hit when they get training and take, you know, take time off the road for something like that is, is the way that I'm tackling that so that we're, and I'm really even not trying to get one senior tech that all the other guys come to. I'm trying to, um, elevate, you know, every single person with, to utilize their own resources and to, to learn to raise their hand when they don't know something and, and to learn how to do it for the next time. So it's, it's a slow process. It's probably not the best. I'd love to hear what other folks are doing. That's, that's way better than that, but that's, that's kind of how I'm approaching it. Mm -hmm. That's great, John. The, um, now one of the things that you thought seemed like a strong point of this business when you bought it was that, the seller owner was only there a couple hours in the morning. I think you said he was out by like 930 every day. He had other business interests, I believe. I don't think he was on the golf course. I think he was doing other stuff, as I recall. Um, so it wasn't that you wanted to stop working at 930, but you just thought that it, that that suggested there was a lot of slack for you to, you know, not have to go in there and just be right up to your eyeballs and operations all day long because the previous owner had not been. What I'm hearing from you, though, now is that that you you really have been very deeply involved in the operations. You were forced to because this event happened, but maybe but maybe you would have had to be more involved in the operations anyway, even even if that hadn't happened. And you said yourself, like when you initially got there, you were really eager to work yourself out of the day to day. So, and and yet, you know, you got your eyeballs on every job, as you just said. So, so where are you? What did you learn? What was the truth of this actual business? And where are you in that progression? Yeah, this is kind of a, a multifaceted answer, probably. I would say that what I found was the there there really wasn't a ton of need for me in the day-to-day. So the, the check-in process from start to finish is less than an hour. Um, and then we have a, a tremendous office manager that is quite capable of handling very many things, but 
kind of similar um, to the, the the term code debt that I, I really love. There was a lot of kind of operational debt to the company. Mm-hmm. So yes, the owner hadn't really reviewed any contracts that the company had signed for the last year or so, but that meant there were a lot of bad contracts. And mm. that meant that I had somebody call us and say our contract with you and we didn't even have a copy of it. And so it there were that's probably one of the simpler examples, but just unraveling all of the, the organizational debt and the I mean, simple stuff like twenty five different email addresses that were all used for different purposes over the last twelve years and phantom Google business profile listings and um just things like that that just take forever. And then, and, and so that's kind of one facet of it was, was that operational debt that, I, that I've been trying to work our way out of. And then another facet is the previous owner was a technician when he began. So what was easy for him to just see and know by feel was impossible for me to understand. And so I had to do a lot of learning. I, I still don't know how to fix an appliance but I'm a little better at understanding where we are in different jobs and understanding which technicians are performing um, better than others in more than just a number sense. So I had to learn a lot about that. And then the last thing was that I, I, I think the, the company didn't have any sort of direction, no, no future goals or plans other than just, we kind of will try hard and hope we grow some. And when we get busy, maybe it's time to hire a technician. Um, so I, I came in and, and, um, just personally, I don't operate very well (laughs) in a system like that. So I've, I've had to build, I've I've been using kind of the entrepreneurial operating system from traction and I call it EOS light for our company because we don't really fit the mold of that, but we, we are using that kind of meeting cadence and planning, uh, framework to, ask ourselves where we want to be at the end of the year and at the end of three and 10 years, and then work towards the major milestones to get there. And all of that is new, the, the process and the goals and the working on things other than just getting the jobs done every day. So mm-hmm. it's been, it, it, it hasn't been that I have jumped in. I have started answering phones like the previous owner didn't. Um, I have been an extra set of hands on some jobs, but for the most part, it hasn't been that I have been that I've jumped into the day to day of fixing appliances so much as the there's just been a lot to work through with the company to kind of keep it as a growing going concern and to grow it um, into a, a more sustainable company. If hypothetically you didn't want to grow it, you weren't you didn't have big ambitions for the company. And you invested a year, year and a half, even of just the transition, truly, you know, working out the transition and kind of cleaning up the messy bits of the business. Do you think after all that would kind of like settle out that you actually probably could just work a couple hours a day, a few hours a day, and the thing would, and the business would carry, carry forward, not grow necessarily, but be okay. Just curious, hypothetically. I think, I think so. And, and I've had that thought earlier in the year when I felt like we were getting to a really good point, I have that thought every now and again, could I just step back if this is running well and we could keep it that way? And I think, I think the answer is yes, but I think it would be periods where stepping back would just cause a little bit more debt to accrue and our operations would cause things to get a little bit more stale. Um, There's just some, some functions like, finance and marketing that are on my shoulders. I haven't asked anybody else to do much of anything with those. And so I think if I kind of strip myself down to just those functions, um, we could probably do okay. Mm -hmm. Certainly Mm -hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't grow. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. John, you, you did a Twitter thread about, um, kind of the this is hard theme that we hear from small business buyers. Um, And you were kind of like, it's a cliche to say that this is hard. I want to talk about how I have found this to be. (laughs) Uh, Do do you, I have it in front of me here, but I want to just ask you, do you remember 
if there were six things in particular you listed, do any of those like immediately come to the top of your mind as, as you know, I guess what would be the hardest if it's what comes to mind first? Yeah, I, I think the number seven there is that I'm a complainer sometimes and I like to get online and complain. So, <laughs> um, that, that's, uh, I, I'm not that way in person all the time, but I think what started that whole thread in my mind was how many times I've heard people say about small business that it's hard, it's tough, it's difficult, you know, it's, it's not easy. And every time I heard that before I got into it, I just, I thought, well, yeah, that's, that's fun. I love a challenge. I love those kinds of things. And what I didn't fully appreciate was just how specific that word hard is. It's, it's not like you come home at the end of the day and you're physically tired. Um, but mentally you're the same way you are as when you don't have, you know, the, the future of a company on your back. And I wanted to kind of get the point across that when, when you hear somebody say something is hard, that's, that's an abbreviation. It's a summarization of 10 or 20 or a hundred very specific circumstances where you don't know how that's going to turn out. So I may say, you know, dealing with an employee, uh, who, isn't motivated to do the work is hard. And that's true, but the very specific part of it is that I don't know exactly how to say things to them. I know it's affecting other members of the team, but I'm not sure what I should say to those members of the team. I know that it can't stay this way, but I'm not sure how long it should stay this way or what my duty is to attempt to motivate before we you know, head to the improvement plan and eventually the firing stage or something like that. And so it's, it's a very specific hard. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think that's captured well when we use words like hard or difficult or whatever. And I don't think that there's any way to capture any of that really well. It was just something that was really on my heart that day. Um, and then I don't know if this was a part of that one or, or a part of a different one, but I think the other part that, um, that, that I really remember thinking a lot about was the ability to make decisions under uh, a different kind of pressure than you've ever been before with, um, you know, the pressure of the, the fear of embarrassment is a big one for me, um, which is, you know, funny that I'm getting on here telling everybody about it, but, uh, I think it's, it's helpful in a, in a lot of ways, but just the idea that, you know, it's easy to see a bunch of people doing a bunch of really successful things and just feel like I would go bankrupt 10 times over if I didn't ever have to tell anybody about it. But the fact that people, you know, if people would know that about me is, is like a worse fear in my mind. Um, and it, and it just makes it hard to, to make good decisions, to make good long-term future oriented decisions that are, that are for the best. And, and rather it, it makes it really easy to make the short term decisions to kind of, um, you know, uh, curl up and, and defend the, the little you've got left, um, to the detriment of, of the, the overall goal. Be because it makes you kind of more risk averse or because you just, you feel like you need to demonstrate these little mini wins so that your audience quote unquote, um, sees that you're, you know, you're being successful. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, it, it's, it's, yeah, that, that I've got to protect, this little bit so it doesn't go away that risk averse mm. the the mm. your sense of the risk grows and grows um and then feeling like i would it, for me I, I would feel like an imposter to share little wins along the way without also sharing the other losses and so it can breed this sense of kind of disconnect from the world that you see that seems to be happy and doing well and you start to feel like i can relate less and less and less um, and it's, it's just easy to get yourself into this bad cycle that just spirals downward. Um, so, and fortunately, you know, to be fair, I've had tons and tons of support, um, from family, friends, and, um, people in, in our company and everywhere in between. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I have not had to deal with any of the worst, uh, you know, effects of any of this kind of stuff um, in terms of the extremes, but it, it, it was just, as I was writing that it was just something I, that I thought like, you don't, you don't recognize if you've never been in this situation with this kind of pressure, um, 
how how much it affects your your mindset and your thinking. Yeah, that's so good. And and the other thing that you were just talking about, John, the the it, it's hard thing. I think that's really because I agree. I mean, I I I think it's a really s- subtle um, but powerful distinction. Like what flavor of hard it is. I'm kind of as as you spoke. I was I was like you know you, running a marathon is hard. Um, you know that that upper level class you took in college is hard, but it, there were parameters to that, the, to that, like there was a beginning, a middle and an end. There was a clear like end point or goal. Like you knew you were, it was going to be difficult, like work to get there. But so the, the distinction, I guess, is like, like you said, I think you said like th- there's a lack of certainty. Um, you're just, it's, it's hard and like, a, maybe this won't work out hard. Like this really, and it's also not, it's also not like a marathon, like you choose to run. Like if you fail at doing the marathon, nothing bad really happens other than your pride. If you fail that class in college, nothing bad really happens other than your pride. Although hopefully you don't need it for your, your requirements for your major. <laughs> but, but whereas this is like the stakes are extremely high. Um, so there's also that level, the, the, the differentiator. So anyway. Yeah, that's exactly right. Without those boundaries, the the negative results can be way worse than, than any other type of hard. And so it's, it's not like running a marathon where I know if I just do the training, I can do it. Or yeah. if I've got a ton of work on my plate, even if I just stay up all night, I can do it. It's, yeah. it's I might stay up all night and fail and just be exhausted and failed the next day. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's like a lot of things in life, like you kind of feel like, if you just brute force it, you know, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but in this case, brute force isn't the answer. Um, you can't brute force your way through like an employee who's causing all kinds of problems. There's no brute force answer to that. It's yeah, it's, um, great. It's great. It's great. Great. Um, point that you made there, John. Okay. Um, we are pushing up on time. So I want to, but I still have a couple things I want to ask you. Um, this this thread you did close or maybe it was an answer to somebody's one of somebody who asked you a question on the thread and i quote i strongly believe i acquired the best business available at the best terms available at the right time for me and my family best business ever no way going to be a great investment eventually absolutely care to elaborate on that thought (laughs) or does it Um, speak for itself i i i still agree with that and I, I had all of those qualifiers in there, uh, timing for my family, you know, the best available. Um, but that that's life. And I'm, I'm still extremely happy to be in the spot I'm in. You know, I always, uh, or or at least often, you know, kind of sign off on my tweets with, um, this is fun. And it, it still is, I still, you know, in in spite of all the kind of difficulty and darkness <laughs> that um that i seem to some for whatever reason feel is is helpful to others in some ways um i i still can't imagine myself doing anything else i still look 10 years in the future and i've got ambitious goals and where i want to be and where i want this company to be and i'm not the least bit worried about whether we're going to make that happen or not um but that's where I am now. Um, I wouldn't have said I was there six or eight months ago. Um, but absolutely. I think this is going to be a great investment and that, that I'm really happy to be doing exactly what I'm doing. That's powerful, John. I mean, that's powerful. If you feel this, this, that level of confidence about five, 10 years from now, um, after a really hard year, I mean, I think that that really kind of says it all. Um, and I actually, I noticed just to close this out here, John, I noticed that in your Twitter bio, Twitter bio you say, I bought a business, uh, plans to repair a business, always searching for the next. Is that, does that mean like literally you'd be, you'd be a, in a position now to, to do a bolt on a second acquisition or, or what? It does. Um, I, we did uh, what I would term a technically a bolt on a couple months ago uh, where uh, we, we, it was more of an aqua hire. Um, we got two technicians in the deal. Um, and that's been just phenomenal because of 
the two technicians that we got and, and the timing of the way that worked out. Um, I don't know that there's been a ton of value in that business itself, but it, it also came with that, you know, commensurate price. And so that was, I'm, I'm happy that we did that, but, um, I'm certainly looking at, uh, more deals locally or, you know, regionally and would love to be able to do that. And, you know, I, if, if there was a business that came up 600 miles away tomorrow, probably wouldn't be able to make that work. But, mm -hmm. um, but that is, uh, acquisitions are part of our, uh, strategy. And so I'm ready to, to get on that today with any, any, uh, I'll, I'll look at any deal that comes across the desk for sure. Mm -hmm. John, I, did, I have one more question for you, just uh, back into the weeds a little bit. You know, my impression, I think from probably our first interview was that there's not a lot of competition in town. Um, you have, I think, like a, a kind of a big competitor. Um, was there any sort of sense of vulnerability? I mean, I guess there was poaching of your, of your text, but I was going to say, was there any vulnerability to your business that you, that A, there was a new buyer, you, and B, that this buyer was not from the industry and was a kind of complete outsider to the trade. Did that, how did that play out with respect to your competition, your competitor? Honestly, I don't really know. Okay. I, I didn't, I, I haven't seen anything visible that I would consider any sort of like direct attacks or anything like that. Um, I think just the way it is in, in, in our particular market, there's not a lot of need for that. Um, there's, uh, it, it's certainly tough to, to grow. Um, but I don't think that either me or I assume my, my larger competitor is looking at the other one saying their customers are the ones that I need. Mm. So the, it, it, I, I don't, I, I was concerned um, at the beginning that there may be something that they could do. Um, but I haven't seen that. I, I guess, um, I won't share, but I could think of a couple of ways that you could make it painful on a person new to the industry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I don't know that I, I, I don't recall experiencing those. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. We got a good break on that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to share with, with people? You know, one thing that I've been pretty bad at sharing is even even going through these tough times, there have been so many bright spots. I mean, I, I call it a roller coaster every day. Um, my wife asked me how the day was when I get home and almost every day, you know, typical small business roller coaster today. And I think I've been a little remiss in sharing some of those those high moments. Um, there's just great uh people in our company that go above and beyond for each other and for customers. Um, there's been times where we've uh, been able to accomplish way more than I thought would be possible in a given day or week or something like that. Um, there've been some big wins where we've implemented a new strategy and it's worked. Um, there've been just really sweet moments uh, with employees and uh even even customers on occasion that are going through something in their life and uh we're able to to be exactly what they need in that moment and mm -hmm. so and, and then there's even these these uh glimpses of of business success if you will that hmm. um that we're seeing or or a a really bad thing i'm worried about that doesn't end up happening um or we're able to prevent it and so there's just the it's a roller coaster that has these lows for sure um, but it's got highs too, and it is just incredible um, to to get to experience and be a part of that, and and in some ways have that pride of of knowing that um, you know you're instrumental in something really good happening in a person's life. Um, so I don't do a good enough job sharing those little things that um, that I come across every day, uh, but they're certainly there, and it's it's like I said, this is fun. This is exactly where I want to be. And it's for all, for all those reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, a beautiful note to end on, John. Thank you for saying that. And I do just want uh, you to know, lest you feel that your, you know, your Twitter feed is like ne super negative or something. 
that's not my impression of it. And you know, you're you're the this is fun guy after all. I mean, that's your <laughs> that's your trademark. <laughs> so uh, just keep putting that in there, and uh, no matter what you say in between, we'll still get the impression that you know you're you're having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> I appreciate that, Will. Um, John, so how do you prefer? I'll I'll have links to all your stuff in the show notes. But any any preference in terms of how people reach out? Yeah, um, on Twitter at Fund of One with the number one um, is probably the best way. DMs are open. I do love uh, connecting with people and and um, having conversations, and um, love to love to help out any way I can and um, provide any uh, experience or realness or whatever it is that. <laughs> anybody's looking for help with. Great. All right, John. Thank you very much for coming back on. Thanks so much for having me, Will. This has been fun. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Make sure you subscribe to the Acquiring Minds channel below. We are now publishing twice a week. So tons of new interviews and stories to come. Stories that will help you along your own path to acquiring a business.